if we're going to understand how technological engine systems work, which we're going to be getting into shortly, we need you to understand the laws of thermodynamics. And these are rather closely related to the laws of energy as well, so hopefully you won't find this too difficult. We've got some terms to clear up with you. We want to talk about open, closed, and isolated systems. Here's an example of an open system over here. In an open system, you'll notice that uh, this is completely open on the top here, and both matter, in other words, substance, and energy can both get in and out. So molecules are free to get in and out of this tube. Energy can come and go. It'll, if it's warm, it'll start cooling off, etc. If you put it over a Bunsen burner, you can heat it up. It looks like energy and matter can both get in and out. In this closed system, you'll notice it's got a cork in it. So matter can't get in or out. The matter is completely trapped inside this tube. Now you can transfer energy to it if you wanted to. You could heat it up and make it hotter or you could allow it to cool down and it would lose a heat energy but the matter is trapped. The third type is isolated and this is a rather hard one to actually do in reality but try to imagine if we could take this same tube and not only is it sealed up on the top but it's completely isolated from contact with any other system around it. And this is important to understand because What's going to happen here is not only is the matter contained, but so is the energy. Energy can't get in or out of this system either, and so the amount of energy inside it must remain the same. So let's talk about the first law of thermodynamics as mentioned in your textbook. It's basically a version of the law of conservation of energy, and it simply says that the total amount of energy in an isolated system, like we just showed you on the previous slide, stays constant or stays the same. Energy can be transformed from one type to another, we've talked about that before, but it can't be created nor destroyed. So if we consider this fellow here in the picture as a, a system, uh, then we could say, listen, there has to be an accounting for all the energy. If we put in five units of energy, and let's say these are five joules, if we put that into his body, and he does this perhaps by eating, and then let's say he stores, he puts on a little weight here, I guess. He stores one unit. Well, then that must mean that four units are left over as waste that come out of the system. There has to be an accounting for all the energy that takes uh, place in a system, both in and out. They have to equal. The second law of thermodynamics essentially says that heat flows quite naturally from a hot object to a cold object. So please understand, it's heat that's moving, not cold. So heat always goes from something which is hot to something which is cold. Cold doesn't travel. Cold is merely the absence of heat, if you catch my drift. Uh, now this natural movement of heat always going from a hot object to a cold object, we can use that uh, to do some work. It's never 100% efficient, however. Some of that heat that's being transferred always goes to the cold object, no matter how much you try to get useful work out of it. You're always going to miss out on it. And that lost heat has an interesting name. It's called entropy. So that's heat energy that we just simply were not able to use in our engine. So in this diagram here, we see we've got a reservoir uh, that's got uh, a high temperature. So we colored it orange. And naturally, heat's going to flow from him to this cold reservoir down here. That's quite natural. What we're going to try and do with an engine of some sort located here where this circle is, we're going to try and get that engine to do some useful work to us. So that might be to move a load or do some other kind of work for us. However, no matter how well we make our engine, we are unfortunately always going to get some heat that escapes and goes to that cold reservoir anyway, and it didn't do any useful work for us at all. And, and that's what we call entropy again. Now, humans have tried over the centuries to manufacture machines that uh, used 100% of the energy that they were given. In other words, they were, they were perfect. There was no loss of efficiency. And here's some diagrams here of some of these uh, attempts to do this. And, and if you examine each one of them, you'll find that uh, none of them work. Sometimes kids feel like, oh, I could make one that works. Well, you know what? If, if you could do that, you're going to win a Nobel Prize because no one succeeded yet. For example, take this first one here. The idea is uh, that you've got a little a ball here that's uh, magnetic, uh, made of iron or something like this. And at the top, you have a strong magnet. And this magnet looks like a, even a bigger ball. Well, the idea is, is that this little ball will be drawn up the ramp towards the big magnet, and then it'll fall through this hole, slide down to the bottom, 
and and start all over again and this would go on and on forever the truth of the matter is uh, it, it won't in reality if you tried to build this thing to get this ball to go up the ramp you'd have to have a magnet so strong that when the ball goes up the ramp there's no way it'll go through the hole it'll get stuck to that magnet permanently and it's not going to drop anywhere they all have their flaw many times the flaw is friction simply because the machine has many many moving parts in it the friction of those moving parts consumes a lot of the energy in the machine and therefore it's never a hundred percent efficient now a heat engine as we mentioned is basically a device that exploits or makes use of this natural tendency of heat to go from a hot reservoir to a cold reservoir so if you look at this diagram here you can see we've got our hot reservoir and a cold reservoir and of course the energy is going to go from the hot reservoir to the cold reservoir now in between that's where we stick our engine we're going to take that natural tendency to make our engine move or do something. And in this particular case, we're trying to get a piston to go up and down inside of a cylinder and make a, a wheel, the green wheel, turn around and around. Um, we can see some other examples of heat engine that use this. A jet engine, for example, in an airplane, pretty straightforward. Uh, air comes in through the front and is compressed so it goes through all these blades and the air gets quite squished and compressed quite quite uh, quite tightly we then add fuel jet fuel we ignite it right here and then we get a tremendous amount of heat released well that causes the air to expand many 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 times its volume and so you get a tremendous outrushing of air out the back of the jet engine uh, much much stronger than what went in and of course this propels the entire operation forward um, a more common example that you would have is shown here with this uh, cutaway diagram of a four-cylinder uh, car engine and what's going on here is uh, a mixture of gasoline mixed with air is ignited inside the engine by a spark plug there is the spark plug right there sends out a little spark and detonates the engine you can see when the engine uh, when the gasoline uh, explodes because you get a nice bright uh, yellow orange explosion there that of course forces the piston down the piston is connected to this gizmo here which is the crankshaft turning around and around so all the pistons are connected to the crankshaft working together as a team to turn that crankshaft around and around will then connect it to the wheels of the car now if you want to study this diagram and see how it works if you have a look at the blue valve what he's doing is he lets in fresh air and the fresh air is shown as a blue filling up the cylinder so fresh air comes in the piston then squeezes it or pressures it tightly the spark plug then ignites and it blows up in that in that yellow orange fireball that you see and the exhaust the black sooty stuff is pushed out the exhaust valve shown here in red and that'll go out the exhaust pipe of the car so what's happening here is we're using this engine to use this this heat exploitation uh, we take the potential energy that's stored in gasoline or fuel or diesel or what have you we then uh, cause that energy to be released and we do that by using a spark or a flame and we release a tremendous amount of heat and of course that heat contains a tremendous amount of energy this is going to cause some object in the engine to move as that heat tries to go from a hot place to a much cooler place in the case of a car that cooler place is to travel out of the exhaust pipe and we're going to use that to make our engine go around so this is what a heat engine does it takes the natural tendency of hot objects to travel towards cold objects and uses that to get a little bit of work out of it it's never a hundred percent efficient uh, the car engine here for example has a lot of moving parts it's going to generate an awful lot of friction and you probably know that car engines if you let them run for even a little bit they get very 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 hot and so obviously not all of that energy is being used to turn the wheels of the car a lot of that energy is just being shown up as heat in a hot car engine and again that's another example of what we call entropy right that's heat that we simply can't use now by contrast a heat pump is kind of the opposite of a heat engine and a good example of a heat pump would be your refrigerator now you all know that the inside of your refrigerator is is cold 
Well, how it does that is it has these uh, coils on the inside of your fridge, which you may or may not be able to see. And, and inside that coil is a, is a low pressure gas that's very, very cold. And of course, the heat that's inside your fridge will go from hot to cold. So hot objects that are inside your fridge or that have heat will naturally go towards these coils, which are cold, right? These are kept cold. Now, now how is that done? Well, the way that that's done is that the, the vapor that's inside those coils was once a liquid. And that liquid is then caused to expand as a, as, a, as a vapor. And so you may have noticed, for example, if ever you've had an aerosol can that has a, a, you know, a spray top on it, for example, and a little valve, and when you push that down, you get a spray out of it, you may have noticed that this spray is incredibly cold. If you put your hand in front of it, you probably feel how cold that is. And the reason for that is very simple. When, when liquids are made to evaporate, there's a tremendous drop in temperature. It's called the, the heat of evaporation. We use this, for example, when we perspire. By evaporating sweat off of our skin, we get rid of an awful lot of heat inside of our bodies. Your refrigerator does the same thing. Perhaps this diagram can show it a little bit better. You have a pump inside your fridge, and sometimes you can hear it when it kicks into gear and makes it sound. And what it's doing is the vapor that comes back to it is then compressed under high pressure into this condenser. And these condenser coils are typically located on the back side of your fridge. You'll see them uh, up against the back side. You gotta be careful that you don't pinch them or break them. You don't want this fluid to leak out. But what happens in here is the pressure builds up and so you end up having the, the vapor uh, or, uh, or the gas that came out of your fridge. It, get, it gets converted into a liquid. The liquid then goes through this little tiny valve. And this is a lot like the nozzle on a spray can. And so what happens is the liquid goes in here and it comes out on the other side. It comes out as a spray. It comes out on this side as a vapor. So we have liquid on this side. We have gas on that side. And this gas is now quite cold, rather like the aerosol can we talked about. The spray feels very, very cold. This then goes to your fridge. So this is the inside of your fridge compartment here. So there's fridge, short for refrigerator. And the, this gas, of course, is very, very cold. So what's naturally going to happen inside your fridge is that heat that's inside the food that you just bought at the store and put into your, uh, put into your fridge when you unloaded the groceries, that heat is going to travel towards the evaporator in your fridge. It will absorb that heat and transport it back through this circuit. And so it's a complete uh, circuit. It never, it, never, uh, it never ends. The fluid goes from being liquid to vapor, and as it does so, it, it absorbs heat. So back in the evaporator again, we have a gas, and it becomes a liquid again, absorbing heat as it goes. So we're working in the opposite direction as a, of a heat engine. The heat engine uses hot objects going to cold to extract some energy in that process, whereas the heat pump essentially does that same thing, but works in reverse. And in order to do that, you've got to use energy because you're sort of going against the grain this time. It's going to cost you some energy. You're going to have an electrical bill for this one.